Gate NHS, thus the Galactic Imperium enforce peace. Chapter 4. Written by Varu Knight. Pina was amazed. They were flying in the air, at a speed not even the Wyvern riders would be able to reach. She looked to the rest, beside her and her two knights, the rest seemed relaxed. When she looked at the two, they were fidgeting, they were afraid of heights. Which Pina found adorable. We'll be reaching Alna soon. Lucius said to her. So soon. We're only just flown for half an hour. Pina exclaimed. Pina looked over the window and saw a massive fortress in the shape of a star. She saw the monstrosities that the JSDF have. She saw the iron elephants shoot out powerful explosions of magic right into the mountains. The iron pegasus circled about the base, patrolling their boundaries. As the firefly began its descent, she caught a glimpse of the rifles being fired at. Is everyone in the JSDF all mags? Pina muttered. No, they're not. The same to the Imperium. It's a weapon that made JSDF efficient against the Empire. Lucius said as he caught the attention of Pina and two of her close allies. How does it work? Pina asked again. Put it in your terms, a piece of lead we call a bullet was enchanted with magic and placed into the cylinder of the rifle. Looking at the model, that's a Hoa Type 64. Judging by the vehicles here, I think the JSDF have purposefully equipped their soldiers with Cold War era weapons. Lucius said. I think it's cost efficient. That said, I have to say truthfully that you foul Martians are too backward. Too backward, I say North Korea would be able to rule you over with ease. If you're wondering, North Korea is another country that to our standards, is backward. The fact made Pina shocked, it means that the empire is far weaker and had no chance of winning. Even a grunt in the legion would understand the severity of the fact that a nation considered backward can rule them over. Still, Pina was curious to know how the young master of the Imperium would know. The Firefly class landed right in front of the Alnus Gate, where a few people had been waiting for their arrival. Lucius was first to walk down the ramp, followed by Pina, Boses, and Panache. The people waiting for him saluted at him, giving their utmost respect to Lucius. General Lucius. Welcome to Alnus Base. I am Lieutenant General Hazama, it is an honor. Hazama greeted him. Just as he was reaching his hand for a shake, one of the Cerberus soldiers intervened. Hands off the young master of the Imperium. The soldier said. This made Hazama instinctively pull his hand, as he and the rest who were there were shocked by the revelation. It appears you have not informed me, I apologize, Lucius said. I am Lucius Aurelius, son of Augustus Aurelius III, Imperator of the Galactic Imperium. A general of the Cerberus. Nice to meet you, Lieutenant General. Lucius reached his hand out, as Hazama shook it. Well, I apologize. I didn't know that you are a member of royalty, I would have prepared a much grand welcoming committee befitting a royal. Hazama said. It is fine. It's due to concerns for my well-being, that my identity is to be kept hidden. Lucius said. Though, I think it's not necessary at the moment as I am to make an appearance before your diet. Well, we did report it and the Diet did approve of your visit. But this revelation, I don't think it is safe for you to travel there. General Hazama voiced his concerns. That, and I don't think the accommodations would be to your liking. Considering that you are a royal. You need not worry, my safety is assured by my bodyguards. And I am a soldier as well, I am safer in the company of my men. Lucius said. Even though I am royal, I am well accustomed to mediocre accommodations. We Aurelians have lived moderately, nothing to grandeur. I see. Then please, ride this way to Japan. Hazama said as he lead Lucius to the gate. Just parked in the side, are two limos and a military truck. One is already filled with the three local girls, Chuka, Lele, and Rory. Along with some of the third reckon, Kuwabara, Kuribayashi, and Itami. Hey! It's nice seeing you well, I guess. Itami called out. Lucius laughed before any of his bodyguards could protest. I see you are fine. I hope nothing happened to your half. Lucius said. Oh, something did happen. I got shouted at by the colonel. 
It was bad. Itami whined. Lucius's baggage along with Pinares and her entourage were put in the trunk of the limo. Once everything was in place, everyone entered the limos as they drive away to the gate, followed by the military truck filled with his Cerberus. It was dark, like the first time he crossed over. Then a blinding light phased them, and they saw the tall buildings of central Jinza. They all got out, but once Lucius got out, he took a look around. While the gate is securely barricaded and guarded with soldiers, it's not enough. There are a lot of flaws that Lucius could tell, and it would be easy to topple the defenses and disconnect the gate altogether. He breathed in the slightly polluted air, but the cold air masks the polluted air with the chilling breeze. The visitors from Falmart, including himself waited outside of the fenced gate, waiting for transport. Itami was talking with an old man, suspiciously uncouth with his afro hair and wearing a trench coat above his suit, and he was accompanied by two well-dressed people who Lucius can tell that they're agents. Suddenly, Kurabayashi wailed out in disbelief. That made the uncouth man laugh at it. Then the uncouth man noticed Lucius and approached him with his two agents. Well met, Prince Lucius. I am Komakado, of the Intel HQ. I'm currently with Public Safety, and we are here to escort you all. Komakado greeted. The revelation brought yet again surprise to Itami's group. But it was cut short, as a bus came over as their transport. The visitors' group then boarded the bus, and it drives off as they are followed by the military truck. Lucius was seated on the right side, and he saw the busy streets of Japan as people walk about to do their business. The buildings, the scenery, it was as if he went back in time. Which could be said, hadn't the world been an entirely alternate universe? Why is the tree decorated? Tuka asked. Lucius looked to where they were seeing and saw a Christmas tree. Oh, it's a Christmas tree, Lucius answered. Christmas tree? Tuka asked curiously. It's a decorated tree in occasion to celebrate Christmas, a worldwide holiday celebration. On the eve of Christmas, families and loved ones come together to have a feast, to rekindle the joyous relationship between them, and to have fun. Lucius explained. In the morning, families and loved ones give presents to each other. To show how much they appreciate each other. Do the Imperium celebrate Christmas as well? Itami asked. Yes, only on human, majority planets. Though it lost the religious meaning of it, it's still a celebrated holiday for everyone. Lucius said. The bus stopped at a clothes shop. Itami explained that Tuka would need more formal clothes to appear in the diet, and jeans are not formal. So while they shopped for Tuka, Lucius just waited at the bus. It didn't take long, to his relief. And the bus drove again until it stopped again for lunch. And who would have known, Itami decided that they have lunch in one of Lucius's favorite fast food restaurants, Ushinoya. He was ordered a gyudon, along with a raw egg to top it off. As Lucius was about to crack the egg, Pina, Boses, and Panache were rather hesitant to eat it. But in the end, they relented and eat it. It was a great choice to make, as they began eating heartily, savoring the flavor. After all that, they resumed their journey. And finally, they reached the parliament building. There were no news crews outside, and it's great as he doesn't want attention, not yet. He stepped down from the bus, only to notice that the three girls with him are not. The princess and her entourage are to meet the advisor of the prime minister and the foreign minister, Kuwabara explained. I see. When will I get to meet them in person? Lucius asked. Soon, I heard. But now, the diet and the entire world are expecting you. Komakado said. Lucius followed leading Komakado right to the conference room where the many important figures of the government of Japan are waiting. Along with local and international news crews, with many of them are from international crews across the world. This is due to leaked information spread about a week ago, and it's about a more advanced civilization existing on the other side. The information came with sightings of the Imperium's aircraft, which stunned the international community as a whole. After a while of navigating, they turned into a corner, where many agents are being placed for security. Komakado stepped away, as Itami lead the group of five into the conference room. Degree 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 degree. It has been four months since the last attack on Jinza. 
The first question and answer session regarding this matter will be held in the Diet today. A news crew began their reports of the event. In addition to the SDF personnel who have been on the ground, there will be local refugees. As well as what the SDF have dubbed, the most esteemed guest will attend the Diet session. People who were walking on the street stopped to see the news coverage from the live billboards. Offices stopped their work as they paid attention to the news, families gathered around their TVs, and friends watched together from their phones. They've just entered the room. The news crews then began to face their camera to the entrance, as Itami walked forward, followed by Lele, Tuka, then Rory wearing her veil and her covered halberd. Then behind them, is Lucius in his glory. Wearing his uniform, he asserts his view as the esteemed guest. Lucius walked forward, following the other four while being bombarded by distant flashes of light. He sat on his reserved seat, as the session began. We will now ask questions to the witnesses. The chairman began the session. Miss Kuhara Mizuki, you may begin. A young woman in her late twenties walked up to the front podium across from him. When she arrived at the podium, she pulled out a board. I'll get straight to the point. She said. Why were the 150 special region refugees, who were supposed to be under the protection of the SDF killed by the class, a dangerous animal you called Fire Dragon? Lucius frowned slightly at the antagonizing question given by the woman. If she was a citizen of the Imperium, she wouldn't last long disrespecting the hard, working members of the Militarum. Witness Itami. Itami stood up and walked to the podium. Though, he gave quite an amusing answer. Ah, uh, probably because the dragon was too strong to handle? He said nonchalantly. How can you be so calm? Don't you feel any responsibility for the lives that have been lost? Well yes, it is a terrible loss. But there is nothing we can do about it, as I also feel that our capabilities are lacking. Itami answered. So you admit that the SDF is at fault? Mizuki exclaimed. No, we lack sufficient firepower. The answer stunned Mizuki, as Itami continued. Our 7.62mm bullets bounced off the scale of the dragon as if they are BB bullets for airsoft. Upon facing a natural monstrosity like the fire dragon, we currently do not have the means to repel the threat without any further support. Itami said. Should we were ambushed, like the last time the fire dragon attacked, any singular unit without sufficient firepower would struggle to repel the threat, let alone survive the encounter. My unit and I are very lucky to survive. My point is, that we cannot operate how we are supposed to be when you are here cutting our budget. If I may, Chairman. Another jumped in, and from what Lucius can see, he was backing Itami and the JSDF. The Chairman allowed the man to take the podium, and he did. Upon our discovery, it appears that the dragon had scales as hard as tungsten, and they can breathe out high temperature flames. The man said, the beast, essentially, is a walking tank. Demanding zero casualties while fighting this beast is rather illogical wouldn't you say? This again silenced Mizuki, however, the session is far from over. Very well, then my next question would be for Miss Lele La Lalina. Lele stood up and walked up the podium. Do you understand our language? Mizuki asked her. Yes, a little bit, Lele answered. Very well. I am told that you are currently living in the refugee camp. Are there any inconveniences? I do not understand what you mean by inconveniences. But if what you mean is that everyone has freedom, then that is true for everyone. Lele replied. I'll change the question. Is there anything you require lacking in the camp? Food, shelter, clothes, employment, and spiritual needs are all met. If we ask for more, it would be met. Lele answered. Then you do feel the SDF response in any way, contributed to the result of the 150 casualties? None. Lele simply said. Lele stepped down, as Tuka was summoned to the front for her testimony. My name is Tuka Luna Mosso. Daughter of Hodolu Ray. She introduced herself. I am an elf of the Lodo Forest clan. Forgive me to ask, but are those ears real? Mizuki asked her. Yes. These ears are real. Would you like to touch them? Luna offered. 
she'd brush her hair aside, and she placed her ear for display as she toyed with it twitching. Murmurs of awe began to fill the room, as attendees began to film the rare event before their eyes. W. Well then. Do you find anything peculiar with how the SDF handled the situation when the dragon attacked? Mizuki asked her. Forgive me. I was unconscious at that moment, so I have no idea what has transpired. Tuka answers her. Tuka's answer wasn't satisfactory for the diet, so Rory was called up front. Ms. Rory, please describe your life in the refugee camp. It's simple. When I wake up, I pray. I received life, I pray. And at night, I sleep. Rory said. Pardon, but receive life? Yes. I eat, I kill. I make offerings to Emloy. A lot of other things. Rory answered. Seemed nerved by the fact she casually said kill, Mizuki then reworded the question. By the look of things, it seems that you have lost someone dear to you. Do you feel the SDF is responsible? She asked. This confuses Rory, as to how she was perceived to be in mourning. Lucius caught on to what the woman was trying to do, and he frowned at it. According to the reports, fourth of the refugees were killed in the dragon attack. Whilst the SDF suffer no casualties nor a single injury. Mizuki pushed on. The soldiers who were supposed to defend you put their lives and safety first, and at the end of the day civilians suffered the most. This warranted a reaction of shock. It was what Mizuki wanted, but not for the same reason. Now, tell us what you see. The exposed truth behind the SDF. She pushed, thinking she won the jackpot. Oh, you fool. You utter fool. Lucius thought. Are you stupid? Rory shouted right at the MIC and it deafens the entire room. It was so loud, everyone had to cover their ears. Everyone but Lucius. W, what did you say? I asked if you are stupid. Little girl. Rory said. You want to know how they fought the dragon? They did their absolute best. They certainly did not use the refugees as shields, nor they fought at the distance. Mizuki gritted her teeth, as her plan backfired badly. Then again, what's wrong with soldiers making sure they stay alive? Rory began her defense. If they fight needlessly, who's going to protect people like you? Who sits comfortably and does nothing but complain, little girl? Mizuki was annoyed, yet kept her silence as per ethics. They fought a fire dragon and came back alive. The first thing you all should have done is to praise them. You need to rephrase the sentence as well. It's not that one fourth of lives were lost, but three thirds were rescued by Itami's squad. If you can't understand that, then I pity the soldiers of this country, as they would most definitely have a hard time here. Rory remarked. They succeeded in doing something no one else could do. That is my answer to your stupid question. Do you understand now, little girl? There was silence, as the diet was taken aback by the response. However, one did not. Lucius clapped his hands, appreciating what she has said, as it hit his core as a soldier. Then many join on, but many didn't. As they felt humiliated by Rory, Mizuki especially. You don't seem to know how to speak to your elders, little girl? Mizuki argued. Oh, are you referring to me? Rory asked. Of course. I don't know how it is in the special regions, but here we respect our elders. She retorted. I'm shocked. How a mere mortal dare to speak to me that way. Rory's lips turned indigo, in her eyes you can see bloodlust if you are well accustomed enough to war. She began to untie the covers of her halberd, but Itami rushed in. Mr. Chairman. Diet member Kuhara is badly mistaken. He said as he began to push Rory out of the podium as he took control. Um, you may not believe this. But Ms. Rory Mercury here is the oldest person in this very room. Just how old is she? Mizuki asked. 961 years old, Rory said. All eyes shot up wide, that includes Lucius. In the Imperium, a human can reach the age of 800 which is the maximum age of a human but to see Rory being that old, with very young looks surprised Lucius. 
even Imperium humans began to age when they reached the age of late 500. A. And how old is Miss Tuka? Mizuki asked, somehow wanting to make her psyche more damaged. I'm 165, Tuka answered. D. Don't tell me. No, I'm 15, Lele answered. Mizuki took a huge relief, if Lele was more, she would have gone insane. Lele took the stage, as Itami gave her the position. I am a human, we live our lives until the age of 60 to 70. And most of the residents of our world are all humans. Lele began to explain. Tuka is an elf. They have a long lifespan and do not age. She is a rare fairy type, whose age can reach almost eternal. As for Rory, she was once a human. But after her ascension as the Apostle of Emloy, her body ceases to grow. Lele said. Once she reaches a thousand years, her soul will leave her body and she will ascend as a goddess. Thus, the concept of age doesn't apply to her. Everyone was left stunned, that includes Lucius. But instead of believing her as a deity, he deduces that she and everyone that was chosen as an apostle, will eventually evolve. Rory as of now could be a product of genetic splicing by some supernatural powers, and is enhanced with superhuman strength, speed, agility, and regeneration. When they reach 1000 years, those powers would siphon the souls of their respective apostles. In the good assumption, they will be used as deputies of their influence. The worst assumption is absorbed to be their power. Does this answer your question, Miss Kuhara? Yes. She said defeated. She sat down back to her seat, as Lele returned to her. We will postpone the session for a quick break of 15 minutes. The chairman said. Break starts now. Some attendees rose in droves and head out for a quick break, and some stayed within the room. Lucius followed Itami and the girls outside, as they were led to another private resting room. Inside the room, they have been served gallons of different kinds of drinks and quick snacks. Lucius just took a single cup of water. While the girls chat away, Lucius just waits until the time goes by. It didn't take long until they were to return to the conference room. Everyone is seated back, as the next session is about to begin. I now retract the postpone, and now we will begin the session of question and answer for the esteemed guest from across the gate. The chairman said. Mr. Lucius Aurelius. Please step forward. Lucius fixed his uniform, as he takes the podium. His opponent is a young man. He looked around and saw in one section of the seat, he saw Pina and her entourage sitting out of the camera's sight. Mr. Hoshikawa Hiroki. Please present your questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Hoshikawa said. Before I ask any important question, I will ask about your identity for all people to know. Can you introduce yourself to everyone? But of course. I am Lucius Aurelius, General of Cerberus, son of the Imperator, Augustus Aurelius III. Soldier of the Galactic Imperium. He introduced himself. Pardon, but you said, Galactic Imperium. Are you saying that you are from an intergalactic nation? Hoshikawa asked. And by the word Imperator, I could surmise that is equivalent to an Emperor. If that is the case, you are the Crown Prince? That is correct, Mr. Hoshikawa. It is as you surmised. However, the terminology of Crown Prince was never used. It is instead, Young Master or Young Mistress. Lucius said. Murmurs began to fill the room, and many, if not most are skeptical of Lucius's statement. Just as Hoshikawa was about to ask for validation, they heard a beeping sound from Lucius. Lucius looked to his arm phone, beeping for a call. Excuse me for a few moments. Lucius accepted the call, as a holographic transmission appears from his arm phone. These sudden events just validate the truth from Lucius's statement about the Galactic Imperium. A man in a grey uniform appears before Lucius, Mexican in race. Young master, I hope I didn't intrude on your time. You're already intruding, Hector, Lucius said. Tell me, what is it you wish to report? As Hector was about to spit out what he wants to report, he looked around and realized that Lucius was in the middle of the diet session. Hector hesitated to report, and looked Lucius in the eye, hoping that his young master caught on. Indeed, he did. 
we have found the perfect places to build further bases for the 212th and the 501st Assault Legions. By your permission, I would like to begin construction immediately. Hector said. I see. You have my permission to do so, Lieutenant General. Is there anything else? The first batch of supplies and construction ships have arrived at the system. They will begin construction of a starbase above the orbit of the planet's moon, as per your orders. Hector reported. Coincide per your orders, I thought you would like it to be quick, so I issue another order for additional construction ships. That is all I have to report, young master. You are right in issuing additional construction ships. Well done, and thank you for the report, Lieutenant General. Hector saluted away, as he terminate the connection as the projection died out. Sorry, a small interference. What is it that you wish to ask? Lucius said. W, well. I was about to ask you to validate the existence of the Galactic Imperium, though I guess that transmission is evident enough. He said. Oh, is that all? Of course, I would be more than happy to show you more validation. Lucius replied. As soon as he said that, he pressed a button on his arm phone, and from it, the arm phone puts up another projection. This one, however, is much larger and enough to fit the room. The projection then showed everyone in the room, and everyone else in the world watching a projection of the Milky Way. The Galactic Imperium spans wide across the galaxy. Overlord to many tributaries, and one of the protectors of the galaxy. The galaxy is then highlighted on a map. It shows where the territories belong to the Vor Holy Guardians and the Arcadian Peacekeepers and their tributaries, where the Imperium is and her tributaries, and the many other free stellar nations who are with or without the influence of both the Galactic Custodes and the Galactic Council, and the still many uncharted regions of space in the galaxy. And to their immense surprise, the largest of them all is the Galactic Imperium itself. Under the Galactic Imperium, all races are in peace and prosperity. And when I mean all races, I mean not humans with different phenotypes. Like Asian, African, Caucasian, and all that. Lucius said. I mean all races. The Twaxildars, the Maltics, the Golk Furkians, the Zaydrans, the Emtokians, the Durans, the Minerians, the Vors, the Arcadians, the Corinthians, and many other races of the Imperium. All humanoid and non-humanoid, united as one entity. Then the map disappeared as images and footage of many races of the Imperium work together with humanity, in total harmony and peace. In the many branches of government, to the simple occupations such as constructors and clerks in a supermarket. For the last 1,939 years, the Imperium strives through unity amongst her people. We developed our technological abilities, which many humans of old would not even begin to imagine the possibility. Lucius continued. Our people thrive through long years of life. Our starships are numerous and mighty, as is our military. We terraform barren and inhospitable planets, into ones where many races could habituate. We harness the power of the stars, creating near, limitless energy for the next millions of years to come. Almost everything of consumer product is cheap, and all public services are free. Free healthcare, free energy, free education. And yet, we still wish to grow. The projection then showed the many things that Lucius mentioned. From the people who enjoyed the necessities and public services, to footages of barren planets, and moons terraformed into the needs of the Imperium as well as many Dyson spheres in uninhabited systems to harness the energy, of the sun then footage of a classis docked in one of the many military spaceports, and soldiers maintaining peace in troubled planets and interacting with the populace in the more stable planets. The Imperium, despite all her greatness, is still willing to grow. We believe, that in the vastness of the galaxy, we as people, must be humble and keep growing and improving. The universe as a whole is large, and ever, expanding. And within the universe, lies the many uncharted and mysterious galaxy. Lucius said. Who knows what is out there, beyond our galaxy? The Imperium and her allies must be ready. Danger lurks within the deep space, and it is up to the Imperium to defend the galaxy. The universe, if it has to. The projection then shifted into the image of the golden shooting star of the Imperium, as she fluttered proudly in the sky. The projection ended, as the arm phone was deactivated.
everyone was in awe, shocked even. Many left their mouths hung open, out of shock and awe at what they have seen. Does that validate enough, Mr. Hoshikawa? Lucius asked. Why, yes. It certainly was more than enough. Thank you. Hoshikawa said as he straightened himself up. On to the next, question, Hoshikawa said. We have encountered your armed forces on several occasions, the last one was the siege of Italica. The JSDF reported to us that they have spotted a massive concentration of force near the gate of Hellness. I must ask, however. What was your purpose in the special region? Oh, it's very simple. I heard that you were also under attack by the savages of Sadira, which is the same case as us. We were too, under attack by them. Fortunately for us, we were able to minimize the damage to minimal, and we lost no lives in the encounter. Lucius said. However, attacking one planet of the Imperium means to war against the Imperium. And the people across the Imperium space, despite no loss of lives, demanded retribution. The Imperator, my father, issued an order to subjugate and bring the ones responsible to justice. I was chosen, as I was on the planet at the time of the attack, and also the one who orchestrated the defense. I see. I can assure you that the people of Japan can sympathize with you. The attack was sudden for us as well, and many of our people died. Hoshikawa said. How many of them attacked? Around 250,000 attackers, if I recount it right. I give the order to repel them and organize the defense, and succeeded to neutralize many and left at least 30,000 men with 20,000 of them I release them back to tell what happened and what will come after. Lucius said. And now, we're there to enact retribution. I see. I would like to ask you another question. Hoshikawa said. According to the JSDF, you requested that you attend the diet as well. Why is that? Well, I did say that I would like to visit Japan. After all, it's not every day get the chance to be in an alternate world of your own. That, in the 21st century no less. It's like time travel to the past, only it's not your reality. It would be an adventure. Lucius said. That said, that's not all I wanted to do. And what other things you would like to do? Hoshikawa asked. Lucius gave a smile, a warm yet somehow everyone can feel there was another meaning behind it. Of course. The other thing that I would do, is spread the word of the Galactic Imperium. To invite everyone of this earth, to join the Imperium as we open our arms to welcome. Lucius said. Simply put, I wish to invite every nation on this earth to join the Imperium. Murmurs filled the room, they were surprised by the turn of events. And why would you like to do that? Hoshikawa asked again. Simple, Mr. Hoshikawa. You are humans. All of you are. Regardless of phenotypes, beliefs, and differences, you are one race. The human race. And as a fellow human race, I must invite you all to the Imperium's arms. Lucius said. Of course, this is the 21st century on Earth. And as a human of the Imperium, I know that the centuries before our era of revolution are an era of chaos. Chaos. You are all against each other throats for the past 3,000 years. Our 21st century almost came to a world war that could annihilate all life on Earth. Sure, our unification war wasn't that different, only ours simply to unite all mankind while yours would probably be for oneself, gain. A shocking turn of events, but the people of the Diet and those who attended weren't surprised as he is right. The world they are now is a world of constant chaos. Tell me, when was the last time humanity unite as one? The last time would be around three decades ago when the world unite to solve the issue of the hole in the ozone layer. And after that? The unity of humanity crumbled, and you all went back to at each other's throats. Lucius said. I know the world has many massive crises. The tensions in the South China Sea, the tensions in the Ukrainian-Russo borders, and the one close to you, the tensions in the Korean Peninsula. The abuse of Palestinians who many of the world turn a blind eye to, the many wars and conflicts in Africa, and the raging corruption of every nation in the world. This earth that you lived on must be cherished and taken care of. The people who live on this earth, are in a sense your brothers and sisters. 
Lucius's words captivated the audience watching from their homes, offices, and public places. While at the same time, many saw it with disdain and disapproval. And seeing what I just saw, even disunity between the Diet and the JSDF. Your JSDF fought for you, risking their lives for the people of Japan right beyond the world you call special region. And yet, you antagonize and disdain the JSDF in every sense of the word. It's a sad thing to see, even the JSDF in my old earth are much more appreciated by the people and the Diet. It's also the very reason, why I say this to you all. Lucius continued. If this kept going, humanity of this earth will collapse in a much faster rate. At first, I didn't want to pry or push something like this. But as I saw it with both of my eyes, I realized that it must be done. And as a son of Aurelius, I'd be damned to fail humanity, even if they are not of my reality. You are one race. You're not of Asian race, Hispanic race, Caucasian nor African. Those are phenotypes, you are a human. And humans stand as one. The room went silent, as did everyone who watched. They didn't expect this turn of events, and many took Lucius's words to heart. Even the cabinet of the prime minister, including the prime minister himself wondered and took his words to heart. Those who took his words all wondered the same thing. Can it be done? Can humans truly become one? As they wondered, Lucius spoke again. I know what you are thinking. It would take time and effort, but it can be done. I say this because I care, I say this not because I'm an Aurelian, but because I am a human first and foremost. Humans must unite, if not, we would perish. And that's what made the Imperium stand for more than a thousand years, we made friends with our tributaries, we make them our brothers, and we unite as one people. As people of the Imperium. Lucius said. If we can, so can you. All that it needs, is the will and means to do so. We found our means through an extraterrestrial AI who crash, landed and become our guide to the galaxy. You found us through that interdimensional gate. Now all it takes is the will to unite. Lucius stopped. Giving them time to understand and comprehend what he was saying. Mr. Hoshikawa, is there anything you like to ask? I do, Mr. Chairman, Hoshikawa said. I am flattered, and I can say the same thing for the many people here and those who are watching at home. But, why is it that you care so much about humans that is not part of your reality? Because I am an Aurelian, Mr. Hoshikawa. And we Aurelians care about humanity, and generally to any other race in the Imperium and beyond. Lucius said. Always have been for as long as the Imperium has existed. It is in our nature. Pardon, but you say you're an Aurelian. Is that different from being a human? Or is there something else? Hoshikawa asked again. Aurelians are the bloodline of the Imperators. We are humans, but a rather different one. Lucius said. We are different, because the first Aurelian, Augustus the Unifier was created in a lab. Created to be the perfect leader for humankind as a whole. Murmurs began to fill the room once more. It made the people who watched surprised to hear, yet again the fact presented by the representative of the Imperium. I, I see, what made the Aurelians so different than other humans? Hoshikawa asked. Our genetics are much stronger. We do not practice internal marriages, but when the first Aurelian was created, the Sphere, our extraterrestrial AI guide made sure that the Aurelian blood, would be the dominant one in all future offsprings through very advanced genetic engineering. Lucius said. This was made so that the great characteristics of an Aurelian stayed for generations and to keep our general instinct to be the leaders of the Imperium stayed that way. This is somewhat true, in their way. One example was Octavius the Tyrant. He eliminated corruption through a bloody campaign of purges that lasted for many months, as well as reformations to ensure corruption never resurfaced. That goes to the many Imperators after them, and all of them still focused on one goal, the prosperity, and peace of the Imperium. Again, people were brought to shock especially with how he nonchalantly states that his ancestors have committed purges of their own. Then again, the people never revolted which brought either confusion or admiration. I see. I would like to ask a few more things before I am done. Hoshikawa said. You said technology improved the lives of the people of the Imperium. 
and you said that the people there lived a long life. Can you explain that? It is as you heard, Mr. Hoshikawa. We do live a long lifespan, and the advancements we have on the many fronts of technology improved everyone and everything. We are healthier, physically stronger than our counterparts in the 21st century. Lucius said. We have medicines and vaccines against many dangerous diseases and viral infections. And vaccinations added with our strong immunity, we're almost impervious to diseases. I see. You said long life. How long is it? What's the average lifespan of a human in the Imperium? Hoshikawa asked again. Around 800 years or so. Our average lifespan would be around 800 years, after that many didn't live long. Well, it's actually because of the war in heaven many didn't see their age pass 400, let alone see it until 350. If you're wondering what my age would be, it would be 289 years old. Lucius said nonchalantly, again. I spent most of my life as a soldier, ever since I was 24 years old. We grow to our adulthood the same way as before, but when we reach the age of 25, our aging slowed severely. Every century, it would be equal to 10 years of aging. And again, they were brought to shock. To think that humankind would reach such feats. But there's one thing that they are most interested in, the mentioned, war in heaven. You mentioned something about the, war in heaven. What war is that? Hoshikawa asked. Lucius sighs a bad sigh. It made Hoshikawa wonder if should he continue with this. The war in heaven is a war that lasted for a thousand years. A war of good against evil, a war of destruction, or salvation of the galaxy. A war for survival or extinction. It was a galactic, wide war when the galaxy unite to destroy the accursed Ravernals for their atrocities and genocides. I fought in that war, in the last two hundred years of it. It was a bitter war, many millions died just to take a sector, and a few would die just retaking a planet. Lucius said bitterly. In short, it was a war filled with destruction. Planets upon planets burned through bombardments, billions of soldiers, and millions of starships laid waste to the galaxy, fighting for survival. Trillions of innocent lives were caught in the crossfire, many of them enslaved and fall into genocide as the Ravernals conquered every star system and planet they came across. It's either we fight, or be enslaved. Those Ravernal scums even planned to destroy the galaxy as retribution to us for destroying their home world. In the end, we won. And Ravernal survivors are hunted down and killed, and the Ravernals went extinct. But it wasn't without a price, the galaxy lost 40% of its population. Many independent stellar nations crumbled, and many great confederations almost fell apart. The Imperium itself, we lost around 27 billion soldiers, 70 million starships, and suffered 800 million civilian casualties on one incursion to one of our lightly defended systems. Though comparing to others, our casualties are considered extremely light. As Lucius told them about the war in heaven, he also projected the images and the recordings of the war. Its devastation, the horrific deaths of many races, the burning planets under bombardment along with a recording of how they fought against the Ravernals, with it being much more intense than normal urban combat. As well as interstellar battles between starships of both fleets, of how large and destructive it was. And last, but not least, the Battle of Terminal Egress. Thousand upon thousands of starships locked in combat. The battle lasted for days, it filled the entire system with the starships of both fleets as they tried to defeat the other. In the end, the Imperium came up top, with the colossal device destroyed and the enemy fleet destroyed. Hoshikawa regretted his question about the war in heaven. Many were unnerved by the description given by Lucius. So many death and destruction, they didn't comprehend the such scale of war caused that many deaths. Especially the JSDF and the main cabinet, they've seen how the Imperium fought on the siege of Italica. Is that all that you wish to ask, Mr. Hoshikawa? That is all, Mr. Chairman. Just as before Hoshikawa stepped down, Lucius spoke. Before we end this. One word of advice. Lucius said. Humanity must unite for your sake. If not, you would not be ready for the horrors and dangers deep within the darkness of the galaxy. Lucius said. Lucius stepped down from the podium and returned to his seat. 
It didn't take long for the session to end, leaving a great impression of the Imperium to the world. Just a few minutes after, calls came into the Japanese Foreign Relations Office. Sugawara of Foreign Relations was exhausted from receiving the calls coming, demanding one thing, an official meeting with Lucius Aurelius. The same thing happened with the Prime Minister's office, as the Prime Minister received from many world leaders and demanded the same thing, a meeting with the young master of the Galactic Imperium, Lucius Aurelius. Lucius is now in the bulletproof limo of the Prime Minister. With him, are Pina, Boses, Panache, and another soldier of his personal Cerberus unarmed. Lucius was invited to meet the Prime Minister directly, for a more formal meeting with him and the cabinet of his government. He agreed, with the condition that Pina and her entourage are with him to attend along with two of his Cerberus soldiers. Pina and her entourage finished their meeting with Sugawara and Shiriuri Lako and managed to follow the rest of the diet session. One thing is for certain, it was mind blowing. She was too amazed to form words when Lucius's magic device projected such clear images out of thin air, along with what seemed to be live moving recordings, the same as the one the Japanese call a TV or a video as they refer to it. She, amongst the many who witnessed his statement, was in awe. To know such a prosperous civilization, it was not out of spite if anyone from the Imperium saw the Empire as backward or barbarous, because comparing the Empire to them, is like comparing an ant with a god. It was also a complete shock for her, to know that Lucius is around 200 years, much older than the elf. Of course, the frightening thing about the whole session was the imagery of the devastating war of the war in heaven. Such scale of warfare and destruction was unbelievable for her, if she hadn't known better, it would be a war of the gods. To destroy worlds at a whim, to massacre populations at that scale, terrified her. Even more so that the empire which she is loyal to is fighting a war against the Imperium. She already knew that the empire should sue for peace, and surrender if they have to. After that revelation, it gives her much more motive to completely sue for peace. If not, they could just be destroyed with impunity. Even though they are heralded as guardians of many worlds, they too have limits. She only wishes that she could reason with them before their patience runs out. The car stops, as Lucius arrived at the office of the Prime Minister. Lucius alongside Pina and her entourage stepped out of the limo, as they were greeted by a well-dressed man waiting. Mr. Lucius. I am Sugawara of the Foreign Relations Office. It is an honor to meet you in person. Sugawara greeted. Likewise, Mr. Sugawara, it's a pleasure to meet you. Lucius greeted back. The two shook hands, as he and Pina's entourage was led inside by Sugawara and a few of the Japanese Secret Service. After navigating through the building, he and Pina reached the Prime Minister's office. The door opened wide, as he saw several figures waiting for him. He saw the Prime Minister himself, Motoi Shinzo. Then his advisor, Shiriuri Leiko, whom Pina have met a few moments ago. Then the Minister of Defense, Taru Kanu. The Prime Minister stood from his desk and quickly approached Lucius. Mr. Lucius, it's finally nice to meet you. We have already seen each other at the Diet, but not properly met. I am Motoi Shinzo, Prime Minister of Japan. Motoi greeted as he sent his hands for a shake. Likewise, Mr. Motoi. A pleasure to meet you as well. Lucius said as he shook his hand. Mr. Lucius, I am Shiriuri Leiko, the Prime Minister's advisor. A pleasure to meet you. Shiriuri bowed. But of course, a pleasure to meet you as well. Lucius gave her a small bow. Mr. Lucius, I am Taru Kanu. Minister of Defense. A pleasure. Taru said. Likewise, Mr. Kanu. It's nice to meet a fellow military man. Lucius said as he shook his hands. Lucius and his group were led to a seat on a large table, as Lucius and Pina were seated on one side, and the Prime Minister and the rest on the other. Before we begin, I am truly sorry that we summon you so suddenly, and especially after the diet session. I am sure you are most certainly tired after all that activity. Motoi begins the conversation. It is fine, Mr. Motoi. I am sure this meeting would have much importance. Lucius said as he smiled. Well, I would like to ask you something before we begin, Leiko said. Why are you bringing the princess of the Shardaran Empire to this meeting? Oh, that. 
simple, she intrigued me. She has the potential to be a great leader. And since she's now facing two massive powers, according to her sense, it would be great for me to bring her along with me. Lucius said. Let's just say, she's under my tutelage to be a great leader. She could learn many things, and that could shape her into a great ruler in her own sense. My soldier here will act as her translator so that she understands what we are discussing. I see, we understand. Motoy gave a smile. Well then, let us begin our talks. Let us. Now, what's the issue about? Lucius asked. Well, to cut to the chase. Japan wishes to form diplomatic relations with the Imperium for cooperation. In any fronts of advancements. Medical, social, even technology if you could. Leiko said. HM, may I ask, have you thought this through? Lucius asked. Have you thought it through of what kind of response would Japan receive from the international community? I beg your pardon? I don't understand what you mean. Sugawara asked. Oh don't act a fool with me. I'm talking about the Earth's regional superpowers. Lucius said. Have you thought it through? The United States of America, the Russian Federation and the People's Republic of China would not stand idly by as Japan basked itself in the advantages of cooperation with the Imperium. They would find a way to get leverage with Japan, to find a way not only to exploit the inter-dimensional gate but to make contact with the Imperium with force. Not that I mind making contact with them all, but they would certainly think that Japan is currently hogging all the benefits of the Imperium. They would do anything to get what they want, I reckon that they already have operators within Japanese lands as we speak. Heck, they might even already bug this room through a potential mole and listening through our very words. Motoy's face turned sour, along with the rest tensed up. What Lucius said was true, as he already received tip-offs from the intelligence division that foreign operators are already within Japanese lands. Not to mention, the ever-intensifying demands from many nations, now added with the appearance of Lucius, now they want an audience simply to get the Imperium to their side and away from Japan. I understand what you want is to improve the livelihood of your people. I understand that all too well, as I am an Aurelian. Lucius said. Yet, under the custodian code number 15, any custodian members are not allowed to make any sort of agreement with a fractured civilization. Be it a primitive civilization, or an advanced civilization who have achieved interstellar travel. Even under custodian code number 10 stated that any custodian member can interact and cooperate with a primitive civilization to improve them, you are still fractured by how regional nations still exist. In which, even if I talk to my father, it would never be achieved as custodian code forbids it and the Imperium will receive backlash from other custodian members. Pardon, you mentioned other custodian members. Who are they? Sugawara asked. Fellow superpower stellar nations, who are equally capable and powerful to the Imperium. The Arcadian Peacekeepers and the Vor Holy Guardians, the two have existed for a few millennia and they have always been guide and ally of the Imperium. Lucius said. However the Imperium is the leading figure of this triumvirate of superpowers, and it was not out of the blue as the Imperium is the most trustworthy among the three. Ah, I see. May I ask what sort of repercussions should one break the custodian code? Sugawara asked again. Depends on the context of the code itself. In light, of sanctions and the retraction of agreement between the triumvirate. At worst, condemnation and war. Lucius said nonchalantly. Despite all two being long, time allies to the Imperium, should one break trust, a war between the three would follow. The custodes are only possible due to the trust of the other two nations in the Imperium through the work of Marcus the Benevolent. We are the single pillar to unite the galaxy's strongest powers, and if we broke that trust, all that we achieved would be for nothing, and another war in heaven could follow. I hope you understand that. I see. We understand that now. Motoi said. Still, there has to be a way for Japan to cooperate with the Imperium. There is a way, but it would be distasteful for the public of Japan, Lucius said. And that is? Canoe asked. The Empire of Japan swear fealty and undying loyalty to the Galactic Imperium as a vassal, Lucius said. That is the only way. 
That is the only way acceptable to the galactic custodes, as one civilization swears fealty to a member, one must accept and take care of them as one of their own. Receiving the fealty of one civilization means that civilization is trusting the lives of its people to one's members. And as to our purpose to nurture and guide the galaxy, it is within our prerogative to accept. Motoy and the rest went silent. Lucius gave them a very logical reason for his offer, yet he could confidently say that Japan would not give up its sovereignty too easily. Is there truly no other way? Leiko asked. There is none, other than what I give you, Lucius said. May I ask, what benefits do we receive should Japan join the Imperium? Leiko asked. Extensive reforms of your military. Your military will be reformed, and upgrades to your equipment as well. You will receive our humble plasma rifles, the same one that is issued to a soldier of the Imperium that could melt any armor on this earth. Basically, you will be a dominant force in the Pacific, that is until both earth unifies. Lucius said. Social reforms will be implemented the same one we implemented in our version of Japan, which I will assure you will be compatible with your people. You will receive free and standardized healthcare, which I can assure you much higher standard than what you have now. As well as mass vaccinations against all diseases we encounter, and mass genetic splices for health and cosmetics purposes. Your young will live a longer lifespan, as they will be spliced as a normal citizen of the Imperium should. I assume there will be things we must sacrifice, yes? Motoy asked. Yes. As to one, this Earth's standard human rights are different from ours. While criminals are not persecuted to be killed on sight, traitors are. People who are categorized as traitors are corrupt politicians, officials of the government, and defecting soldiers. Lucius said. As per Imperator's Law Article 25 Paragraph, 10, Law No. 10 of 2133, which said, any government officials that was proven guilty of abuse of authority, corruption, treason, and the like shall be put to death effective immediately, with no chance of appeal. Also in Imperator's Law Article 25 Paragraph Law No. 10 of 2133, which said, any civilian that enters an organization belonging to the government, be it military or non-military shall resign and forfeit all civilian rights to the imperial government in service to the imperium and her people. Please understand that this may be harsh, but it came with our experience with traitors who could only do more harm than good. Of course, they are only killed on sight, when they are trying to escape arrest. It's cleared by the judicial court, that the conduct must hold trial should the suspect cooperate with authorities to be given a chance of defending themselves, should one decide to be a justice collaborator, they will be granted a pardon. Motoy and the rest went silent. The benefits are great, though the whole different human rights that the Imperium has put quite a dilemma. Plus, despite the benefits, he's not sure that he would give the independence of Japan away, the Emperor would certainly not allow Japan to submit. Still, the benefits of being prosperous people are tempting. It's tempting, but I am afraid that it cannot be done. The people of Japan would not surrender their sovereignty away like that. Motoy said. It would take a complex referendum of the people to issue that. And I profess, I saw the benefits of being a vassal of the Imperium. It really outweighs the downsides of being a vassal. But again, it cannot be done. Lucia sighed and appears to be disappointed. I see. Truthfully, I am a bit disappointed. I was hoping that Japan would accept my offer, it was a rather generous offer since it would take a much rather slow pace of reformation than others. I guess changes need time. Lucius said. Though, I hope you relay this proposal to your people. The Imperium would be more than happy to accept people from Old Earth, and would be delighted to embrace the people of Japan into the arms of every Imperium. Of course, we will issue this proposal to the Diet to be put into assessment, Leiko said. Thank you. Now I must get going, I am in need of rest. There's nothing to discuss left. Lucius said. Of course, Mr. Lucius. Though, we would be honored if you would visit one of our onsens. Motoy suggested. If you like, we can book you into the MT. Her cone resort for your relaxation. The sudden suggestion made Sugawara and Kano turn their heads fast, as if they were trying to break their necks with the looks of shock targeted at Motoy. Leiko was more refined but was also shocked by the sudden suggestion. A generous offer. Thank you. 
I accept. Of course, I expect my protege is invited as well. Lucius asked. We can arrange that, Motoy said. Thank you for your time. Oh, and before we end this. There's one more thing I must say. Lucius said. And that is? Motoy asked. The Imperium would like to invite Japan and the whole world to visit the Imperium. We would like to invite representatives of this earth, to come and visit our earth. Lucius said. You can bring many people with you. Representatives, military officials, and news crews all across the earth. You could bring your family if you like to, the Imperium would cover the cost. This is by the will of the Imperator, mind you. The Imperator would certainly love to meet people from our old earth. This actually caught them off guard, which really wasn't a surprise. They have asked for witnesses from the local population of Fulmart, and now the Imperium wants to ask the same thing. I, I see. What a surprise. Though, may I ask for what purpose? Motoy asked. The purpose is to simply have the people of this earth visit their brethren of another dimension. Simply, a ride of motivation. The details are not yet concluded, but the Imperator would certainly wish that visitors of old earth attend the Imperial Senate meeting. Lucius said. The Imperial Senate would like to know what progress was made. The meeting would be televised throughout the Imperium space, the galactic custodes, and perhaps throughout the galaxy as a whole. I see, what's the quota of people visiting? Laco asked. How much as you like? You can bring as many as you like. A hundred, a thousand, a hundred thousand, heck even a million would do. Lucius said. It won't be a burden to us, we've transported and accommodated a much larger size of the population since the war in heaven with all the refugees we house. I see. We'll send this proposal to the Diet as well for assessment. Motoy said. Of course, to the world as well. Lucius shook Motoy's hands, and the rest as well. Lucius left the room followed by Pina and the rest. They returned to the limo, and they left the Prime Minister complex along with the truck filled with Lucius's Cerberus who waited for them outside. Pina and her entourage were silent the whole meeting, but she was paying attention to what had transpired. To think the Imperium was that generous, still surprised her. And of course, how the young master of the Imperium refers to her as his protégé. Why did you refer to me as your protégé? Pina asked. Simple, you intrigue me, princess, Lucius said. You have the potential to be a great leader. Naive, yes. But that could be arranged. Her smile blooms on her face. It's nice to receive recognition once in a while. But her smile was abruptly stopped. Princess. Why do you think I propose them to become a vassal of the Imperium? Lucius asked. Speak freely, you are learning after all. Pina was in thought for a moment, as Boses and Panache looked at her with intrigue. I don't know. The Imperium in any sense would not need Japan. The Imperium has much population than Japan, a higher quality of people, much more advanced weapons, and many more. Pina said. I don't know what is the purpose. Simple, really. It's because they are humans. Lucius said. And humanity must unite as one. So that whole speech, it was for real? Pina asked. Not some way for the Imperium to gain favor? That is correct. It is a way to gain favor, but it is the drive to make humans of this earth unite. Lucius replied. It is not just of humans, but other races as well across the galaxy. It is the principle of the Imperium, that we stand as one for a better tomorrow. Pina huffed, as she gave a sad smile. I wish the Empire was the same. All I see with them are prejudice and discrimination towards beastmen non-humans, and make slaves of them. They even enslave humans as well. Pina said. The Empire needed those slaves for a working economy, still I distaste slavery as a whole. Especially with my eldest brother, Zorzel with how he treats slaves. It would a wonderful sight when all races stand as one. You could, with the help of the Imperium you could achieve that, Lucius said. That is my personal opinion. However, the Imperator would have another thing in mind. 
Pina looked at Lucius, the stern and calm face as he watched the scenery of the evening of Tokyo. What would you have in mind? About the situation we are in? Pina asked. I don't know. I need more information on you people. But roughly, I would like to put the ones responsible to face justice. Lucius said. The rest, I still do not know. It is by the Imperator's commands to subjugate the planet with any method possible. I guess I just follow his command to the letter. Pina looked at Lucius, who seemed a bit melancholic about the whole thing. I see. I know it's not the appropriate time, but is there any way for the Empire of Sadira to make peace with the Imperium? Pina asked. Truthfully, no. And even I have no intentions to make peace with the Empire, let alone every single man and woman of the Imperium. Lucius said. That said, we do not wish to massacre the population as a whole. At least, we tried not to. The Imperium is willing to make negotiations of surrender, the reason is to minimize deaths as little as possible. But we are not shy to do whatever it takes to win, including massacring civilian lives. Pina was disappointed. Of course, she understands it all too well. It was the fault of the Empire to just go beyond the gates and just attack and plunder. And the Imperium has been given the means to retaliate. If you're done with us, would you do the same thing to the people here? Boses asked, who caught Pina's surprise as she was silent the whole trip. Maybe we will, maybe we won't. Just know that the Imperium simply react, and we will react. Lucius said. Then why do you care so much about us? Why bother taking us with you when you simply just go on and conquer the Empire? Panache questioned him. Because you need someone to be able to cooperate with the Imperium. Someone who knows the capabilities of the Imperium and the consequences of being against the Imperium, Pina answered. Lucius's smirk amused. A stifle of laughter escaped his mouth. You're smart, princess. I knew you have the potential of being a great leader. Lucius replied. Roughly, yes. The Imperium is an expansionist nation. We kept on expanding our influence through any means necessary be it military, or commercial means. Had you not attacked us, the Imperium will either way expand. Of course, non-militarily. Probably through profitable agreement, just the same one as I did to the Empire of Japan. And now, you're trying to get me onto the side of the Imperium, Pina concluded. Isn't that right? Oh, don't be so negative. Well, except for your beloved Empire. Lucius said. Besides, I care about what would happen after the certain fall of your empire, which is why I'm taking you as my protégé. Like it or not, the Empire of Sadira has sealed its fate with them attacking the Imperium. To this day, we're just holding back. And you know all too well we're holding back. And I think you know better what we care about at this point, which is why I chose you. You're the perfect candidate for the task, as Fallmart would need a direct figure to follow. Pina sighed heartbroken. She thought she could reason with the Imperium before it was too late, but the curtains are already closed for any attempts of negotiations before it began. I guess there's no other way, is there? I don't even know if I can do it. Pina doubts herself. With my guidance, you can. Sadira will fall, but your culture will not. Your bloodline will not, and the people will stay the same. Except when we splice them with long life, so not exactly the same. Lucius japed. Your people will thrive for the exchange of a new management under the Imperium. Pina dropped her head low, as she rubs her dimples and forehead. After taking a long sigh, she faced Lucius with conviction. If it's for my people, I will cooperate, Pina said. Princess. Are you sure about this? Boses question her. There has to be another way. Panache convinced. Are you all deaf? Or are you still in denial? Pina retorted. The Empire's fate has already been sealed the moment we attack the Galactic Imperium. We could negotiate with the Japanese, but there will be no negotiations with the Imperium. I intend to preserve whatever I can, so I must cooperate. Panache and Boses hang their heads low, heartbroken. They weren't when Lucia said all those things, as they still have conviction and believe that their princess would do something out. 
To see their princess submit to a foreign rule broke their heart, yet they cannot be mad at her. They have caused her troubles back in Italica, which could have jeopardized their princess's safety. As well, despite the blatant act of treason against the empire, they are loyal to her first and foremost. It was a sad sight to see their princess submit to the invaders, yet as their princess said, there can be no other way. Lucius gave a warm smile, contend that the princess is now under his influence. Excellent. You will be treated with the utmost respect by the Imperium, as the governor of the planet. Which later date, you will have full control of your world to rule at your whim. Lucius said. I will teach you all I know about planetary administration. Along all the things about being a governor of the Imperium. Pina was caught off guard by his statement. The entire world, at her command? It's every emperor's wet dream. And he will give it to her just like that? Pina was beyond amazed. Then again, to be overlords of hundreds of thousands of worlds, giving one to her would be the equivalent of giving her an old shoe. I see. I look forward to being under your guidance. Pina replied as he gave a slight bow, to which Lucius responded with the same thing. Say, may I ask? What was it that the Japanese talked to you about? Lucius asked. Well, they were talking about prisoners from the last attack. They have at least 6,000 men of the Empire captured. Pina said. They said they are willing to release them, in return for favors and rights to use the natural resources. Figures. I just wanted to make sure what I suspect. Lucius said. They'll exploit as many resources they can, and then when they're done, or everything at full mark wasted, they'll leave you collecting scraps. Is that so? Well, what do you think we should do about it? Pina asked. I have a plan for that. Though, first we need to finish what Resistance Sadira has to offer with whatever method we can do. Lucius said. Of course, with your help. The whole ride back to the hotel was silent. It was appropriate. After all that busy day, a little silence is welcomed.